Hello friends and welcome to worship with us at Lake Oswego United Methodist. My name is Jade and I'm so honored to serve as the associate pastor here among the people in this place. This Sunday is Communion Sunday, so before we get started in worship, I want to invite you to go ahead and get your elements, whether it is bread, maybe a sandwich bread, a bagel, um, or even grape juice, wine, anything that you have in the house, so later in the service we can share that meal together to taste and see that the Lord is good. So as we get started in worship, I invite you to ground yourselves. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you created this world with enough, enough for us, our neighbors, and all creation. You created the world with not just enough for ourselves, but with enough for us all to share. But even though we know this in our heads, it can be hard to feel it in our hearts. We are so tempted to hoard up the things in this life that make us feel safe. Money, our career, our work ethic, and our success to name a few. We admit that we put our trust in these fleeting things instead of you and the reality of your abundance. Speak words of peace to our weary hearts this day. Loosen our grip on the things we hold so tightly. In our release, fill us with your love and grace, just as you do when we come to your table. Whisper to our hearts that just as it was in the beginning, we have enough, enough to share. And let that word of grace transform us more and more into the likeness of your child, Jesus. That every time we come to you to give you what doesn't feel like enough to our weary hearts and minds, you always surprise us with your radical and abundant grace that opens our eyes to see that what we have is always enough for you to work wonders with. Amen. When I first read this passage to prepare for today, I was moved by Jesus' compassion for the crowd. Over 5,000 people, more, probably more closer to 10,000 people, had journeyed from near and far to meet him in the wilderness. Even though Jesus had other intentions for his day, he could not turn his back on this assembled crowd. Here we see Jesus moved by compassion for others, turning aside towards others to meet them in their pain, to meet them in their suffering and their sorrow, and to heal them, to give them hope. In the original Greek, this word compassion we see evokes uh, that feeling when we have knots in our stomach, that feeling when our heartstrings are pulled to where they feel like they are about to snap. And so today, I want us to experience this scripture differently than we normally do, to make this reading a little more real. So take a moment right now and think about a time when you were moved like Jesus when he saw this crowd, moved with compassion towards another. One of those moments when you felt pulled towards another's suffering. For in that movement, you, in that moment, excuse me, you were moved like Jesus. Ground yourself in that feeling, in that experience as you hear Mark read these words from the Gospel of Matthew. And if you are comfortable, please share that moment in the comments section at any point during the sermon. I would love to have a glimpse at what that moment was like for you, and I think our church family would too. Let us hear the word of God. Good morning. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they could go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up the twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The numbers of those that ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. May this word be bread for the journey. Amen. As I hear the words from this passage, 
I am taken to the streets of Portland. A few weeks ago, my household made a trip from the suburbs to the city, and I must admit I was overwhelmed. As we made our way to Belmont, there were more tents than I had ever noticed before in downtown. Maybe now that I'm in the suburbs, it seems more jarring since I don't see it every day like I did when I lived there. And in that moment, that in that overwhelm, my heart was breaking and I didn't know what to do. My breath was taken away in the worst kind of way. How many times have you felt that feeling? Maybe if not driving around Portland, but somewhere else, so overwhelmed with such heartbreak at seeing your neighbor, seeing our fellow human being struggling so much, so much that you don't even know where to begin. When I sit with the scripture, I think more often than not, we're more like the disciples than Jesus. How many times have I, have you, have we had the opportunity to act? But like the disciples, we get stuck in the overwhelm. We get stuck in the overwhelm instead of leaning into what God might be calling us to do. We feel the compassion, but we stop short of acting. For the disciples, it was lack of food. How would they feed so many with five loaves and two fish? It was a mindset of scarcity. They didn't think they had what they needed to do what Jesus was calling them to do. And for us, maybe it's not food, but I think we too can fall into this trap of thinking we don't have what we need to do what God is calling us to do. Those moments when we feel the pull towards another, when we feel the pull to do something, to be something, and instead we get caught in the lack, in the perceived lack of money, ability, know-how, courage, time. And so we don't do what the Spirit is prompting us to do. There once was an experiment done at Princeton Theological Seminary where students, then all men, were assigned to give a sermon on the Good Samaritan story. The tale in the Gospel of Luke where a man is beaten up and left for dead on the side of the road. While the man is there dying on the streets, two religious officials walk past him. And the story culminates as the most unlikely of people helps this man on the side of the road. The students in the experiment were asked to prepare a sermon on one part of campus and deliver it on another. As each student finished their sermons, researchers added a time constraint. Some were told, you're late. And so these students had to hurry on over to where they were giving the sermon to introduce a hurry condition. Others were told, they're ready for you, please go over now. This one introduced a more intermediate hurry. And some were told, they'll be ready for you in a few minutes, so might as well head over. This was a low hurry condition from the researchers. As the students made their way from the classroom to deliver their sermon, they each encountered someone in a deserted alleyway. The person was roughed up, looking like a wounded traveler, just like the parable of the Good Samaritan. The person was slouched over, coughing, and looked destitute, clearly looking in need of assistance. But as the students made their way across campus, more than not, they didn't stop. As they went to deliver their sermons, only 10% of the students in the high hurry situation stopped to help the victim. 45% of students in the intermediate hurry and 63% of students in the low hurry condition helped the victim. The researchers concluded a person not in a hurry may stop and offer, offer help to someone in distress. A person in a hurry is likely to keep going. Ironically, he is likely to keep going even if hurrying to speak on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Thus, inadvertently confirming the point of the parable. Thinking about the Good Samaritan did not increase helping behavior, but being in a hurry decreased it. Time and one assignment were more important to these future church leaders than helping someone clearly in need. And in that moment, scarcity won. I've heard of this experiment before, but recently I took an intensive through Emory School of Theology and the story came back on my horizon. 
The week after the class completed, I was headed to see my spiritual director in Newburgh. I was a little early, so I decided to stop by the Goodwill as to spare my few minutes. Turning into the parking lot, I saw an older man looking quite disheveled fall on the sidewalk right in front of the building. While I was going to park, I saw him fall again and again as he was trying to use his cane to get up onto the bench. And I wish I could tell you that I parked my car and ran over to him, but I didn't. I got out of my car and watched people one after another coming in and coming out, staring and walking by. And I too, with a heavy heart, was one of them. My heart was breaking, my heartstrings pulling, my stomach in knots. And as I made my way inside, I could not stop thinking about the man. I must admit, as a woman, approaching men by myself is a little scary, but my conscious, maybe the Holy Spirit, were all pulling at my heart to go. I went outside and saw the, men on, the man on the bench. With my mask on and six feet away, I said that I saw him fall and just wanted to make sure he was okay. The man looked at me and said yes, that he was just trying to get a moment of rest. And as I stood, stood there, I asked if maybe I could get him a bottle of water or something from inside. Um, and he looked back at me and said, well, actually, could you give me a ride? And in that moment, I felt the knots in my stomach again. I looked down at my watch and only had 10 minutes to get to spiritual direction. He said it was only two stoplights down the street in church. I stood there for a minute and I wrestled with yes or no. And, and I said yes. I told the man I need to give my husband a call just so he knew that I was giving someone a ride and in the Prius and down the road we went. The man's name was Izzy and we made small talk as we made our way to the hotel that he was staying in. Once we got there, he went to get out of the car and then he stopped and he looked at me and he said, thank you. And he said, you know, they call me Izzy because my middle name is Israel. Funny, huh? What a curious thing to say. And I don't tell you the story to act holier than thou. If I'm honest, I am embarrassed to speak it out loud that I didn't rush over to this man from the beginning, that I had to wrestle with the thought of giving an elderly and appearingly homeless man a ride. I'm ashamed that my fear and my anxiety got in the way of doing what my heart was saying was right. And I don't tell you the story either so that you give a ride to anyone and everyone that you see on the side of the road. But I want to say is that I don't want a perceived lack of anything of time, of anything else, to come in the way for you being present to others, to come in the way of you doing what God might be calling you to do, especially when it is for those on the margins. I wonder if when the disciples asked Jesus to send the crowds away to get food, if he looked back at them with the same compassionate and loving eyes as a mother, when he told them to give the people something to eat, Jesus' eyes being like that of a mother looking at her beloved children, seeing that they had everything they needed to do what seemed impossible. I can see the shock and the worry and maybe even some fear and maybe frustration on the disciples' face when Jesus looks back and says, you give them something to eat. And they look down at their five loaves and two fish and can't make the math come out right. As they look and see these crowds, this multitude, all of these hungry bellies, how would they feed them with five loaves and two fish? With loving compassion, Jesus looks at his disciples and tells them to bring their humble offering. Jesus takes it. He blesses it. He breaks it and gives it back to them. And you know what? There was enough. Enough for them and the thousands and thousands and thousands gathered until all of those people had full bellies. And it didn't stop there, but they all went and were full and there were leftovers, 12 baskets full. Radical abundance when they gave what they had to God. Even when the disciples thought they didn't have enough, 
some way, somehow, it was enough for God to work wonders. And can it not be the same for us today, church? That even when we feel like we don't have what we need, that we don't have enough for ourselves, let alone to share, that Jesus says to us too, Oh child, bring me what you have. And some way, somehow, what we have is enough when we bring it to God and not just enough for us, but for our neighbors, for all creation, and there is leftover. There is more abundance than we started with. That when we bring what we have to God, God takes it and blesses it, breaks it and gives it away. And that is the miracle that we are left with. That is the miracle that we have more than we started, more compassion, more love, more grace, and more faith than we began with. So as we come to the table, as we come to share communion in the next few minutes, I invite you to consider the ways that you have doubted you have enough. When you have turned aside from those promptings of the Spirit, for it is in this meal that we taste and experience God's abiding love and grace and forgiveness. And it is in this meal that we are encouraged, that we are sustained, that we are given grace to go and to say yes to those promptings when they come again. In the breaking of this bread, may you see that all you have and all you are is enough for God to work wonders. Let it be so. Amen. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Nothing worth more that can never come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves And her heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Oh
become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. We gather around the table from places near and far. Eating sourdough, rye, tortillas, crackers, wafers, and white bread. The body of Christ for all who are hungry. Drinking the wine or the juice. From kids' cups and pint glasses. To wine glasses and coffee cups. The cup of love and grace for all who are thirsty. The bread and the cup unite us with all who follow Jesus. This meal reaches back through the centuries. This table reaches around the world. Let us eat and drink with joy. And so together we pray to you, gracious and loving God to transform these familiar things of bread and wine and juice. Bless this bread and this cup, the wheat and the grape, the farmer and the harvest, the seed and the sower, the shipper, the shelf stalker, and the checker outer, all those who labored so we might taste and see your abundance today. Bless these elements and our time together so that in the sharing of these simple things, we may have faith in your gracious abundance, faith in your ability to work wonders through us and among us, so we may live more and more like your child, Jesus Christ, in our day-to-day -day lives. In, with, and through your abundant and abiding love, we pray. Amen. This bread is broken for all of us who have known brokenness. And this cup is poured out for all who thirst for love and for grace and for new life. The body of Christ and the love of Christ poured out for you, for me, for all the world. Church, as you leave worship today, receive this benediction. That even in the moments when you feel like you do not have or that you are not enough, that you can come to God and give your humble offering. That in, with, and through you, God is working wonders. That God is working miracles. Go in peace, go in love, go in grace. Amen.